glad to see it. All right, welcome everybody. Let me see how we're looking. We have um, right now, it looks like 26 attending, 27 going up. So welcome everybody to the first uh, of, of a series of four webinars being put on by the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute and the Carruth Police Institute out of UNT Dallas. Um, I am joined today by B.J. Wagner, the Interim Executive Director of Carruth Police Institute, Paul Stokes, who is uh, one of our leaders of the Smart Justice team at the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, and Kathy and Javier Bustos, who I will be um, introducing more in a moment. So first off, I want to talk about how we're going to operate this webinar. Um, None of us here are professional webinar production people. So it might be a little glitchy. It might be a little wonky. Um, going to be what it'll be. But we, we felt it was important and we wanted to make the time and we appreciate you making time to spend time together and talk about this really important issue of, of policing during the pandemic and how we can all take care of each other. A um, little bit of housekeeping. Because the, you do not have to register for this webinar, uh, you're not authenticated, none of the audiences, um, this is an open link. Um, if you're not familiar with Zoom bombing, it's an issue. And um, we've seen it on college campuses, schools, people dropping in on meetings and being offensive and saying things. So we have all of that turned off. So your privacy is paramount. Um, so we're protecting that as well, um, as best we can in a virtual world in a meeting like this but no one will be able to, none of the attendees will be able to interact with each other. You can only interact with us, the panelists. So the um, chat function is turned on. Um, you will only be able to chat with us. So if there's something that you wanna share, if there's something that you wanna say, we will try and pay attention to that and, and, and um, um, you know, interact with you as much as we can while we're flowing through this. The Q and A is open as well. So. If you have a question, please put it into the Q&A, and as long as they are appropriate for, for those people that would like to disrupt things like this, um, we will answer it. So we will all be able to see the questions that are asked. The audience will not unless it gets answered, and then the answers will be there. Um, we are not going to be doing using the raise the hand function, um, turning anybody of the attendees their mics on. Um, other scenarios, other environments that, you know, Kathy and Javier may talk to about how officers can engage with each other more directly virtually, then you can. But here, for the sake of all of us, we're, we're keeping that turned off, if that makes sense. So without further ado, I would like to go ahead and introduce Javier and Kathy, if I can get back to that. Um, Kathy and Javier Bustos are certified in law enforcement peer support. Throughout their careers, they've experienced many critical incidents separately and together. On August 18th, 2010, they experienced the trauma of a line of duty death of a fellow officer and friend at Kathy's police department in Cedar Park, Texas. A month later, on September 25th, 2010, Javier was in an officer-involved shooting in Austin, Texas. Kathy and Javier were thrust into a new and changed world and they had to adjust their lives for the new normal. With a combined 46 years of law enforcement experience, their mission is to help other officers and their families deal with the stress of critical incidents. They serve as peer support team members at the Bill Blackwood Law Enforcement Management Institute of Texas at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. They volunteer at National Police Week in Washington, D.C. as support services, and they are certified Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Instructors. So without further ado, Javier and Kathy, take it away. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? And thank you for joining all of us on this first uh, episode, this first Zoom episode that we're doing here for, for your benefit. Y'all are the stars, not us, because what we're doing here is we're facilitating a, a process about peer support. And since we all can't be together in a classroom, What's the best thing to do other than have a virtual classroom, right, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And just so you can know, I am not going to get up and go to the bathroom on camera because that's been too many times and I think it's not funny. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but but thank you for joining us. It's very, very important that we're all here. And we hope that everybody gets something out of it. 
So where would you like to start in talking about, let's start with this. We're talking about peer support. So what is peer support? How do you define that? How do you define what a peer is? Um, you know, we're all humans. Does that make us all peers? How does that get narrowed into particular occupations or experiences? What, what, what's as, as peer supporters, how do you guys view that and, and put some definitions of that for us? I think uh, for our part, what, what our definition of peers are is that I would be peer, I would be peer since I'm a, a retired law enforcement officer uh, of 25 years, all of the critical incidents that I've been through enabled me to peer somebody who has been through a similar incident. Um, similar to Javier, I have not been in an officer involved shooting. I can talk about it, I can talk about some common reactions, but as far as being a peer to someone who has been involved in an officer-involved shooting, that's where Javier would kind of step in. But it's basically somebody who's been through the fire, the same fire that you may be going through um, that can help you on the other side of it, help you get to the other side of it. Exactly, and the thing about it is, of course, you have to go through your certifications to be a certified peer, mm -hmm. but at the same time too, when you work with somebody doing the same job, experiencing the same things together, and somebody comes to you and say, hey, that call that we went on together, that really bothered me. Well, you know what? That's when you say, well, tell me about it. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. You've become a peer. You're not a trained peer, but you know what? A, tr a good trained peer is somebody who listens. Listens. And that's the most important thing for somebody who is not a trained peer is listen to what your partner is telling you. And then you can see, okay, you know what? We need to get you some help. And that's when you go to the experts. But everybody's a peer in the essence that we can all listen to each other and empathize on what's going on. It's the next level where you go and you get the certifications to be a peer and you learn about what's important about active listening, about confidentiality. The which is, of confidentiality. That's very important. Yeah. So yes, everybody's a peer. We're fortunate that we're trained peers so that way we can help at a different level. It's it's change. It's also changing the mentality of let's let's have a choir practice or let's go uh, drink under the bridge after shift and and just drink around the problem or do whatever you're going to do around the problem and everything but talking about it. Um, talking about things and getting them off your chest has been proven to be beneficial in in helping with mental health crisis. And so that's what peer support is also. It's allowing somebody to just talk and to vent in a trusting environment. And the most important thing is recently uh, the Fraternal Order of Police, the Grand Lodge, they did a survey uh, and they talked about what would an officer do if they needed help. Peer support was the highest rated thing that the officers talked about. Peer support is the foundation before the clinicians, before anything else, Officers are more likely to go talk to a peer support officer before they go into the, any other levels. And this doesn't offend our clinicians because we have friends who are our clinicians and they think it's great that peer support's the foundation, that it's the number one go-to because a lot of times a peer support officer can get them to a clinician. Right, or a peer support officer can help them so much that they feel better about the session and they got it out and they're ready to, to, to move forward and so in essence, a lot of clinicians say that we are like their screening process for them. <laughs> they end up getting the ones that we can't help as peers and we realize you need more help. So that's why peer support is an outstanding foundation for all of law enforcement and the whole first responder community. So, so with everything that an officer learns on the job, right? How, how, how does that get used uh, you know, professionally and personally to support other officers and families. I think we're doing a much better job now with education because I know when I started the police academy in 1993 uh, there was very little information about my own mental health and how the job would affect me. They basically said uh, your one in four is going to be divorced, uh, two out of three are going to become alcoholic, you're going to use substances, you're going to you know be married three or four times now go out and do a great job. And I know people that came into law enforcement before I did, it was worse then, but that's the information that we got. Our profession is doing a lot better in the fact that now we're starting in the police academy to talk to cadets about their mental health and how they can be affected and providing them resources. A lot of departments are doing that now at the academy level, in service level, police 
uh, cadet FTO training is also, it's being done there. So we're doing a lot better at it. Right. It all boils down to three simple things that we all learn about on the job. Training, knowledge, and experience. How many times has an officer wrote on their affidavits through my training, knowledge, and experience? Well, that translates to what we're trying to do because we're getting better training at the academy level. We're getting better training at the in-service level about peer support, about mental health, about seeking that help. So that's the good training. And then the knowledge is out there. There's so many great organizations out there that put out information that officers are learning now that, you know what, what I'm experiencing is a normal thing, mm -hmm. right? So that's where they're getting that knowledge from. And the experience is the fact that we have years and years and years of experiencing critical incidents. The training and the knowledge help us deal with those experiences, which in turn, in the future, as time goes on, when we see somebody else going through something that we experienced ourselves, we know how to, what to do and help them out. So that's why training, knowledge, and experience on the job translate just as much importantly to peer support because it all relates, it all works together. And like Kathy said, we should not in, have a, um, a mentality where we get all this great training for these uh, police cadets and teach them everything and then send them out there and then we they, never follow up. We never them. follow up with them. That follow up is an important thing that has to happen because uh, we don't want to eat our young. We want yeah. to basically culture our young into a better mental health status where they know they can reach out for help and there's no stigma whatsoever. So in this, um, you know, you mentioned critical incidents, but I'd like to bring the context to, to right now, like COVID, right? So all of the same dangers that are there for law enforcement, you know, you know, going in harm's way, thin blue line, you know, public safety. Um, and now there's this invisible virus that's out there that, you know, you talk about essential services, law enforcement's right out there. I don't I mean, I don't have to tell anybody that's here. Right. Um, the risks and all of that. And what are the work that y'all are doing right now and working in peer support and um and all of that what what are you hearing what are you hearing about concerns bring it you know who knows what somebody could get exposed to and then take home to the family at the end of right. the day like what what are y'all experiencing and, and how are officers dealing with that i i think it's just an enhanced level of officer safety that they're taking i know i'm sitting this one out as a spouse at home so i have a whole different level of concern than than javier does but i think just the education level of being able to talk to people in times of crisis or not in crisis and educating them on, of course, taking the, the regular officer safety steps when they go to, to work, the, you know, wearing your vest and, and using your, your tactical vest when you're out on traffic stops or on crashes and, and all of those things, they have to keep that in mind. But now they have to think about standing six feet from people and using the hand sanitizer and, and yes. all of the things. I'm going to let Javier speak to this because he's out there in it. <laughs> right. I'm just the wife that's at home worried about it. And she says she's just the wife, but you know what? She's my rock because I get to come home to her and I get to unload if something's frustrating me. But just like I was saying, training, knowledge, and experience, right now it is being force fed to us with the pandemic. We're getting the training. Even if it's something as simple as learning how to put on the mask properly, we're getting the knowledge. Information is being passed down almost every day about updates about, look, this is what you can do to avoid uh, uh, possibly catching uh, COVID-19. So we're getting that training, we're getting that knowledge, and then we're getting that experience. As you're out there every day, you're learning what you can and can't do to basically keep yourself safe. Because I know for me personally, and I've told Kathy this many times, it's a changed environment. It's a different world for first responders because I know for law enforcement, we always get up and we, and we go to work knowing that we could possibly not come home. We could possibly get seriously injured or killed. Now with COVID-19, the pandemic, we're going out there and we're basically fighting something that we can't see. We can't smell it. And we don't like that. The, the, we don't like that unknown factor. And that can really be difficult when you're trying to have a positive mental health outlook of it. Because you know what? You can see the criminals coming all day. You can feel when they're gonna resist or they're gonna run. You can't do that right now with the pandemic. So that's why it's important for the training, the knowledge and getting that experience to say, I can't control this pandemic, but I can control things around me. And what I can control the most is myself, my personal safety, the safety of the other officer I work with 
And then of course, going home to our families and making sure that they're safe too and that we're not bringing anything to them. So it all relates. So how does that work? You know, speaking of the families, you know, the, unlike most of the, the, the dangers that our officers face on any given day, this is one they can bring home with them, right? Right. Um, right. Like directly into the house, the threat bringing it right into the house unknowingly. You have that, you have kids uh, at home, you know, not at school, trying to do the homeschool. You have the, the spouse at home they who knows what's going on with their employment at this time you know with so mm -hmm. many things shut down like all of those additional stressors what what's out there what are you all engaged with to, to provide that also that peer support for the families given the given them those the spouses given those them the connections that they need too. how's that work there are a lot of of course there are facebook pages for us uh, particularly for spouses of first of law enforcement and first responders. There's a lot of Facebook pages out there, but there's a, about to be a national conference of police spouses at uh, the end of April, mm -hmm. the end of April. Hopefully and it's, it's virtual, right. it's a virtual conference. Okay, so they we were go. prepared for the pandemic before the pandemic was around. But um, a lot of the resources that, have been utilized in the past are no longer valid. They're the conferences that husband and wives are going to, um, traveling out of town and going to the conferences that we've spoke, we've spoken at many of them, first responder conferences and Blue Health, um, but those have been taken away now. So the virtual, the Zoom interviews, the, the virtual conferences. Facebook Live. Facebook Live, we've been utilizing that quite a bit. Um, that's becoming in the forefront of education for the families. Yes, and then, and the reality of it all, as far as not the officer or the first responder coming home to their family, again, we, we emphasize that you cannot not talk about this. This is an important subject that you have to talk about as a family. Critical incidents, we always say, don't keep your family in the dark with your critical incidents. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the pandemic. Don't keep your family in the dark. If you're feeling something, express your feelings to your family because you know what they are ex experiencing feelings too because they're seeing their officer their first responder go out every day and they're worried about them catching COVID-19 so as a family it's important that you have these open discussions and think you have to think about even sanitizing themselves before they walk into the house at the end of the day exactly <laughs> um, you know we we occasionally see our our grandchildren um over this time frame and you know we have to think about taking our temperature before we see our grandchildren and, and making sure that we don't have our shoes on when we walk in the house and all of those things are now an added stress on the families and that's why we try to provide the avenue um, that we're always available we always have our facebook page and we do facebook live every tuesday mm -hmm. just to kind of people for people to vent and get it off their chest the things that they're worried about during this time frame right and you when you when you get home don't shut out your family. This isn't the time now to, to, to get home and then you, you basically uh, shut them out. But at the same time too, spouses, allow your officer to get home and decompress. That has not changed with the pandemic or no pandemic. We always say the spouses should allow their officer to decompress, whether it's 10, 15, 30 minutes or whatever, give them that time to decompress. It's important because that way they can go from being the decision maker out there, uh, from facing uh, a, a lot of other people and danger all the time, they can transition back to being dad, mom, husband, wife, et cetera. Give them that space to decompress. It is so important. And even after this pandemic's over, we still recommend that regardless of what's going on for officers and their families is yeah. give them some decompression time. And, and on the flip side of that, the first responder who's coming home needs to understand that the spouses have been, you know, perhaps in the house all day with the kids trying to teach them lessons oh, and, yeah. and doing the normal household duty that they have to do. So it's, it's a lot of communication is necessary right now and a lot of reflective feelings about, well, what are you going through and what are you going through? Because it's two completely different experiences, but both of them are equally as stressful. Yes, agreed. So talking, so talking about that, you know, the, the decompress, right? Like maintaining your own health, like just stay, trying to stay beyond COVID-19, but you mm -hmm. know, not catching a virus, but just, right. you know, all of that. What, what are, 
how do they do that? How, what would you be your recommendation to officers to kind of take charge of their own health? And what are some good, you know, tips for that? We're, we're a work in progress because uh, we, when we, we were in the documentary officer involved that Patrick Shaver did, and we were both much heavier then. We were living pretty stressful lives and, and our appearance showed it. And so we are works in progress now. We're, um, we both worked on our health. Uh, Dr. Scheinberg, I don't know if you're aware of him, but he did the cardiac testing on law enforcement officers to be able to show cardiac health among, amongst first responders. And so we both participated in that. Um, we're actively exercise now. We work on a nutrition. And I know that you know, probably five years ago, six years ago, when somebody said, oh, you need to eat right and you need to exercise and you need to drink lots of water, I'd be rolling my eyes in the background going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, tell me that at three o'clock in the morning when the only thing that's open is the kettle. (laughs) (laughs) A water burger. Or a water burger. Yeah. Um, But now I'm a big proponent of it because I know what it feels like to feel healthy and uh, it's it's such a better life to lead when you when you feel healthy and you're you look healthy. Yes, and working on your physical health and mental health is important. Mm-hmm. And you need to prioritize your sleep. Get that sleep in. Mm-hmm. I think people really underestimate how important getting quality sleep in. Uh, how it's so important for your mental and physical health. And uh, that's something that we that we we ourselves have had to work on over the years where it's not like, hey, we're gonna get four hours of sleep and then we're gonna get up and go to work. No, it's important to prioritize sleep because that is gonna set everything else for success with your physical and mental health. Like Kathy was saying, eating better is uh, just as important. Well, sleep, lack of sleep is a big factor in depression. Mm -hmm. All of of the anxiety, all of the things that come along with, with not taking care of yourself. Right, exercise, just like Kathy said. Drink water. Yeah, hydrate, it's important. you know, a lot of people, they like to go to uh, their gyms or they do uh, some kind of martial art or self-defense and everything. And I would just say, keep your memberships because those small businesses need to stay open for you. And in turn, you have a lot of these gyms and uh, martial arts and self-defense places that are doing their virtual classes, kind of like what we're doing right here on Zoom. Uh, so that's a great way to continue doing your physical exercise is if you have a membership somewhere and they're providing those, those services for you, get in on it because I know I do. Well, even uh, do in your that. backyard. Yeah. Even or, if you have a backyard or a front yard or any kind of grassy patch around where you live. Yeah. We know people that they're inventing their own home equipment because they don't have any or they have home equipment and they're learning how to utilize it different ways. So, you know what? Be creative, you know, and get that sunshine when you can. Get that, get that what, vitamin D, correct? Mm-hmm. Vitamin D. Yeah. We know somebody yeah. that they basically use their truck and they laid out to get some vitamin D one day. And that's important because uh, they're getting those sun rays coming in and they're getting a good tan and they're basically getting that nutrition from the sun. So remember, that's important. So kind of comes full circle, right? You were talking about knowledge, training, experience, like all of these, like, I don't think anything that y'all have said is something that we haven't heard before, right? No. I mean, mean, this this isn't rocket science. So Mm -hmm. what, what gets in the way of like the action that like, I know I should drink more water. I should do it. Like how, how do we actually put that into action? What we get in our own commitment? way. <laughs> we get in our own way. Um, like I said, five years ago, I would have been one, the one sitting in, you know, in the back of the classroom, rolling my eyes at the people who were telling me that I needed to drink more water and, and not drink so many Dr. Peppers a day and, and eat, a piece of fruit instead of an apple or, you know, or instead of a donut and things like that. But uh, we get in our own way because we have created a culture and a lifestyle that where it's okay to be unhealthy. And um, that's what we've got to get away from. We've got to get away from our culture of unhealthiness, the same lifestyle that led us to think that one in four, we're going to be divorced and two or three, we're going to be alcoholics is the lifestyle that we came into that, that taught us that we have to eat donuts and we have to, you know, choir practices, choir practices, and we have to eat at kettle or water burger at three o'clock in the morning, instead of bringing a healthy meal with us. Yeah. Meal prepping is an important thing. If uh, you work in an area where everything's shut down and they're not offering curbside service, or you don't want to do the curbside service, which is understandable meal prep, make those healthy meals. 
And that way you can take them with you and you can have your, your breakfast and lunch or your lunch and dinner, whatever, whatever uh, hours you work. Another great thing to stay healthy. And you know what? Who doesn't feel good when they're eating a good meal? And I think, I think it's important to say that because I know I used to feel this way that, that people that could eat whatever they wanted to and still be skinny and healthy and, and all of that, um, it's not easy for everybody. It's certainly not easy for us. We, we work at it really hard. And uh, we know lots of other people that work at it really hard. So it's, it's not an easy task. We know that, especially if you're not genetically blessed, but um, the hard work is worth it. We feel a hundred percent better when we're taking care of ourselves and we're eating healthy and we're doing the right thing than we did five years ago mm -hmm. when we were not taking care of ourselves. That's great. That's awesome. That's great advice. So what, so, you know, there's additional stress, right? Mm -hmm. Like COVID-19 didn't like relieve anyone's stress. It's an added layer right. for everyone, particularly, you know, our law enforcement and first responders that are still face-to-face -face interacting with the public. Mm -hmm. right. um, how, how do we normalize that trauma, the stress, and even beyond the COVID-19, just the law enforcement, the stuff that mm -hmm. y'all do, year in, year out with peer support. How do, what are our steps to that? We just, I mean, we, we daily, we consider it a battle and, and I consider it a battle against whatever is causing first responders to kill themselves at higher rates than, than the general population. Um, we just battle it daily and it's just baby steps. It's all the resources that are out there. Uh, Blue Health, the Caruth Institute, first responder conferences, Limit, um, we are all in a battle and the battle is for our first responders lives. And that's how we see it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that's how a lot of people that we work with see it is that just getting the resources and the messages out there. Right. And don't try and reinvent the wheel, mm -hmm. whether it's a pandemic going on or critical incidents later in your career, don't try and reinvent the, the wheel because again, like we talked about earlier, it's all going back to the training, to the knowledge, to the experience. And, it's keep it simple. That's how we always mm -hmm. say, because whenever we try and try and get off into these elaborate kind of ways of doing things and stuff like that, everybody always falls back to what works and what works is keeping everything simple and keeping everything simple is again, your mental health and your physical health and being able to come home to your right. families and decompress and talk about things. Don't shut your families out. Don't shut yourself out because that's one of the worst things that cops do to themselves is they d get into that denial stage and they shut themselves out because they keep on saying, no, nah, I'm good. I'm okay. And that's when the downhill slide begins. And I think even in our own, in our own departments, we shoot ourselves in the foot because we've got the old timers there. And I consider myself an old timer and we, you know, the old timers are like, don't talk about it because you're going to lose your job. Just keep it in yourself. I'll have another beer. And that's the mentality that we've got to break. Like Javier said early, we eat our own. We, we pass on this perpetual myth generation after generation of the way things are. And in most departments, they aren't that way anymore. In most departments, you can go to a supervisor and tell them that you need some help and they will get you the help you need without it costing your career. Now, with that being said, I know that there are departments out there that are not doing the right thing by their officers. And for them, I could just say shame on you, but most, most of them are. And we've got to quit perpetuating that stereotype of, well, if you, if you ask for help, you're gonna lose your job. Because mm -hmm. in most places, it's not like that anymore. Right, and just as we're encouraging officers to be open with their families, be open at work. And that's where we're going right back to peer support. Mm -hmm. And whether you're a trained peer support officer or you're or you're not a peer support officer yet be able to be open with each other and if you can find that one trusted officer that you know you can go talk to that's great that's one source and trust is a big that's a that's a big proponent of it you have to be able to trust the person that you're talking to right so we, we, we need to stop shutting everybody down at work we need to be more open we need to have those discussions officer to officer supervisors check on your officers as well it's just basically very important that to have that openness at work and it goes from bottom to top. It's that, it's that important, but it's that easy. Wow. So I, you know, in preparation for us to do this webinar, you shared some, uh, some resources with me, some mm -hmm. links and all that. So 
I'm going to go ahead and um, and share my screen and let's let's spend a little bit of time going through these and and why they're important to you and what your recommendations are for them. So let's see. Starting off with those people right there. Those are, that's a great that's a great website. <laughs> <laughs> that's our website uh, uh, for that we have, and you know the, you can learn all about us right there, uh, who we are. Uh, there's uh, some videos that um, that we've done ourselves or that we've been in, uh, articles that we've written for different law enforcement uh, publications, uh, articles that were written about us. But basically, you get to know who we are, and uh, you get to know a little bit about what we do. And we kind of talk about our journey through our articles, <clears throat> through the articles that we've written that are posted on our website. We talk about our journey mm -hmm. in those articles. Everything that we've written is something that we've been through or that we've actually seen somebody else live through. So yeah, a lot of times the articles we write are basically chapters of our lives in mm -hmm. one way or another, uh, which is important. And of course, we have a gallery of uh, places that we've been where we've done public speak presenting and there's links to our social media on there as well. Uh, which is a good launching launching pad because it gets you out there uh, to see what else is out there. Mm -hmm. That's great. So uh, what do you like about Valor? Um, there, I have only done a little bit of work with Valor, but they're a pro very professional organization. Our, um, I believe the assistant chief of Georgetown PD is involved with Valor and I participated in some of the training and it has always been excellent training that I participated in. See. The ICP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. yeah. Go ahead. There, I mean, of course, this is the chief's organization, but the chief's organization is working as hard as, as the fraternal or police organization in trying to remove the stigma of mental health issues in law enforcement. And so they're on the forefront of this. And in fact, they just put on a wellness conference um, just recently in an effort to start creating a healthier environment for the chiefs and for the officers. Mm -hmm. And right now they're putting out great information mm -hmm. uh, about the pandemic. There's our wellness committee. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's a great website to, to pay attention to. So are any of these, if, if an officer wanted to talk to a peer, wanted to talk to somebody or even a clinician, you know, but wanted mm -hmm. to have someone that they could trust that they could talk to and wanted to go outside their department or any mm -hmm. of these resources, what, what do you, what would you? Yes. Would yeah, you they would, they're, they're actually, and I think many of them are doing virtual right. contact right now, but there's also uh, telehealth. And I know in the state of Texas, the, Boudreaux's uh, well, first responder psychology, first responder psychology Dr. in Stephanie Oregon, Kahn, Dr. Yeah. Stephanie Kahn. She's doing virtual care. Mm -hmm. uh, Tammy and Laura Boudreaux, they're in the Houston area and they're doing telehealth. Right. Also Cindy Doyle of code Four couples, a uh, great resource and for doing the, virtual care. Yeah. I think all of them have transitioned to the virtual care right now. Right. And if, and if they can't help you, I know they will find, they will find somebody who you. will. Yeah. And, is, and there we a, try. Is, is there a, so, um, cause I know a lot of times, you know, I, my specialty is veterans, right? Working with mm -hmm. combat veterans. I'm a combat veteran peer support with veterans. And so I know a lot of times is that it's like, I don't, I don't want to have a million different web or try and remember or who or call. Right, or maybe they right. can't take me now. I'm calling the next one. Is there, can, if people just go to your website, can that help them get connected? To, cause I, yes. like, I, what I'm hoping is, people that are here attending this feel like they can trust you and that yes. they could reach out and you could help them find a resource or they can oh, find yeah. it. We're, right. we're very, they can start we're, with you. We're yes. very accessible through our website, through all our social media. You can send us a message that we get and that's happened to us before. We yeah. have done peer to peer sessions from people all over the United States that contact us through our social media and through our website and we do our best. And then, and if they need more help, we find the help that, that where they're at, because we'll say, well, can you at least tell me generally where you're at, what state or whatever. And then we can find the resources yeah. for them that way too. And we have vetted everybody that we offer as a resource. We have vetted them and ensured that they are culturally competent for uh, law enforcement or veterans or whichever peer group that we're working with. Um, our son is a combat veteran and, and so we, we do on occasion spend some time with combat veterans. I have not been a veteran, my husband is, but we do spend time with them. But every resource that we 
offer, we have vetted ourselves. Right. We would not recommend any of these people unless we have a personal relationship with them mm -hmm. and we know what they can offer. Right. But a lot of times there's that moment where you might have to make that phone call. And that's mm -hmm. why we really, really uh, like to tell people about 1-800-COP-LINE. Mm -hmm. COP line is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell us about that. It is a 24 hour, seven day a week uh, cop line, it's cop line for police officers either in crisis or not in crisis or they just want to talk to somebody who is not a part of their lives. It's anonymous and confidential and it's manned 24 seven by retired law enforcement officers. So it's somebody that's been there and they get calls anywhere from I'm actively suicidal right this minute to is it normal that I'm feeling this way? So it's, just, it's a wide variety of calls that they take, but it is first responder competent. They are knowledgeable retired police officers and highly trained. It's a very extensive training that they have to go through. Yeah, I, 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 I'm impressed with Copline with the fact, like Kathy said, is you, you have vetted retired police officers that go through training. It's not like you just volunteer, raise your hand and say, hey, I want to be on Copline. It's extensive training that they have to go through. Right, so they're well-trained and they're gonna be there taking those phone calls. And it's an impressive organization. It's the only international service mm -hmm. that we know of right now uh, for law enforcement, which is a great wow. thing. So, and it's anonymous. If you didn't wanna give your name and you wanted to make up a name, you could call in and do that. Right, and that's the best thing too, is because a lot of times uh, we have people that from what we've heard is they, they don't wanna to say too much because they're worried about their department finding mm -hmm. out. Uh, that's not gonna happen with uh, Copline at all. Wow. What about the Fraternal Order of Police? Oh, love them. I mean, we're <laughs> proud FOP ourselves. And uh, they are putting out fantastic information. Mm -hmm. Like we said earlier, uh, they have a new wellness uh, committee that Sherry Martin is uh, spearheading. And they're putting out so much information when it comes to officer wellness, to officer resiliency. They just had a wellness conference as well. Right. They yeah, did in, in Nashville, Nashville, which we were privileged to attend. And right now they're putting out, just like IACP, they're putting out really good information about the pandemic. And uh, what uh, is, I think is important, which we didn't really talk, talk about, is like, you know, when you, when you always, as a family, should have a plan if something happens as far as like, okay, if your officer is involved in a critical incident, the family needs to make sure that they have contacts with the department through somebody that they know that knows the family that we're going to get Their the wills kids are updated the wills Their are updated critical incident officers are selected and, and things like that and fraternal order of police puts that information out and they're very, also very strong in in washington um you know a large part of our culture is run by politics so they have a very strong voice in speaking on behalf of the the officers in this nation Mm -hmm. and a great resource they're putting out a lot of stuff out there for everybody mm -hmm. to see that's wonderful let's see concerns, concerns of police of survivors, survivors cops yeah. yeah what is that um concerns of police survivors is an organization that takes care of and and offers support for the survivors of line of duty death and i know when i went through it in my department when we lost our officer i did not think of myself as a survivor I thought of the, his, his wife, his widow, Cynthia. I thought of his children, his parents, and them as survivors. But what I later learned through COPS, the Concerns of Police Survivors training, is that as a coworker, we're survivors as well. And they offer support for any survivor of law enforcement line of duty death. And um, it's an excellent organization. They put on camps for the children. And the surviving, uh, surviving co-workers, co parents, parents, siblings. They try and take care of all of the survivors of law enforcement and line of duty death. Right. And and as you mentioned when you introduced us, we every year go to police week because cops, fraternal order police, the National Law Enforcement Memorial Foundation, every year they have police week and we go there as an honor to do peer support at the host hotel for the, anybody they, that yeah. needs it. They do a phenomenal job taking care of the survivors. It, yes, it's an excellent job. And right now, because COPS knows uh, how uh, this pandemic is affecting everybody, they're putting out information mm -hmm. uh, just as good as FOP and ICP, so people can use them as a resource. And you know, it's unfortunate, but because of what's going on with the pandemic, these fine organizations have to get together and say, 
we can't have police week because it, there's too much risk involved. So for the first time ever in the history of police week, it got canceled. And you know what? Again, that's where peer support's important because you have people that they were ready to basically mourn their loved one one more time at the, the biggest ceremony that you could have at police week. And now they're stuck in that cycle. It, 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 and it's more, gonna be another a, a whole, whole other, other year, year before they can- Right, and cops, yeah is there for them and cops will get them the help they need because there's so many cops organizations all over the United States that they know that people are hurting and cops will make sure that these people will get the help. They will get the peer support that they need. So it's important. Mm. Wow, that is important. Um, and the Warriors Rest Foundation. Warriors Rest is based out of Oklahoma City and they are retired law enforcement who have put together an, a not-for-profit organization that does peer support training and counseling and they help put peer support teams together and how to sustain peer support teams and they are a wonderful organization we met um, them through our work at police week and have been friends of theirs and they're very professional and I've been to their trainings and also assist in some of their trainings and teaching. And they're just an excellent organization to fall back on in the Oklahoma area. If you need peer support, um, Kathy Thomas is, is a clinician in the Oklahoma area and they are a wonderful organization completely and wholly dedicated to peer support and peer support training. Right. If you need to start up a peer support unit, Warriors Rest can do that for you. They're one stop shopping. They're going to get you certified and they're going to get you good up and running. So that way you can have a peer support unit for your department. That's really cool. Um, so hopefully we, the, those of you attending this webinar, you, you've gotten some good stuff. You, you feel like you can trust Javi and Kathy and um, we're going to open up the floor um, for questions. So please, um, share share whatever you like and and um you can do that anonymously that option is there we can see um we have a question here that says what qualifies you to be peer support and how do you suggest screening people that want to participate on a team we talk about confidentiality but we know rumors spread rapidly mm -hmm. in the wrong years yes. so how, how would you guys answer that we have both attended the peer support training through International Critical Incident Stress Foundation. We have been through the basic and advanced training multiple times over, I've, I've been involved with ICISF since the 90s and Javier since early 2000, but we've both been extensively through their training um, and many other peer support training classes through ICISF, through Bill Blackwood Law Enforcement Management Institute, through Warriors Rest and in other conferences that they have where they train on peer support. Uh, some good uh, accrediting people to become peer support members is different departments have different ways of doing it. You can have an oral board. Um, you typically want to select somebody from each division of your department. It's good to have dispatch communications. It's good to have even animal control. Um, I've come to learn through some of my education now that the animal control workers have a higher rate of suicide than, than first responders do. So it's important to think about all of your employees when you're thinking about peer support. But as far as confidentiality, I think most departments know who the gossips are in their department. And it's really important that you not have those people on your team because one breach of confidentiality in your team is done. Right. You just don't take a whole bunch of officers and say, y'all are going to be peer support. Right. That would be the biggest mistake. Like Kathy said, you need to have those oral boards. You need to ask the tough questions because if you have a whole bunch of people that are supposed to be your peer support and you're having officers go to them and basically shed everything to them about what's going on and they're talking about it to everybody else, that your team is done. Team is done. Yeah. You'll never have the credibility uh, as a team or as an individual ever again, because no one's going to trust you. Mm -hmm. And we, I know when I started my peer support team at, at my department, I had, they had to sign confidentiality binders and they, and they had to sign agreements um, for appropriate behavior and things like that. So that's one way to do it. And what you want to try and do when you're looking for somebody to be on the peer support team is to choose people who have been through critical incidents 
of various kinds and have come out the other side better for it. Um, we, everybody knows those people who have been through a critical incident and never recovered from it. That's not the people that you want on your peer support team. You want somebody who has come out the other side. Right. Yeah. We, we, unfortunately, we've seen people that they have desire to be peer support because they went through something. But when they start going through the certification, you realize that they have not really dealt with their own critical mm -hmm. incident thoroughly enough. And that usually comes out in training. It does come out in training. And then you got to go back into the whole peer support mode and say, you know what, this person needs help. And maybe at a later time, they can be a good peer. Mm -hmm. But right now we got to get them back to a place where they feel a lot better about themselves and how they can handle things. And it's also good to have a psychologist involved or a mental health professional involved in the oral boards. If you can, if you have one in your area that works with your department, it's always good to have one of those involved in the, in the selection of the, the peer support team member. Right. And like what Kathy says, when you're dealing with your clinicians, they have to be first responder knowledgeable. Right. And that's why it's so important, like Dr. Stephanie Kahn, who not only was a, a law enforcement officer, she was a daughter of a law enforcement officer, and she was married to a law enforcement officer. It's people like that, and Cindy Doyle, who is married, married to a law enforcement officer. Right. You need those clinicians that live in our world that understand that. Because too many times we have heard in peer sessions where somebody got sent to a psychologist. And, or EAP. Or, yeah, through EAP or whatever. and what they had to tell the psychologist about the critical incident, they traumatized the psychologist because they, they were, ended up having to consult the psychologist because right. they were so deeply affected by what they heard. Right. So your clinicians definitely need to be first responder knowledgeable and know our world because that gives the buy-in mm -hmm. when somebody goes to see them and say, okay, they know where I'm coming from because they, they live in my world in one way or another. Right. You know, and that you, you were just talking about the, um, you know, the, the, the like staff psychologist on, on at the department. We have a question that, what are your thoughts on agencies mandating yearly emotional wellness visits with a police psychologist, you know, every member of the department? And then with the only information being shared with the agency would be a, if an officer stated they wanted to hurt themselves or someone else or that they've committed a crime. So what, what, what do you think about that as being a general practice that everybody has an annual visit for emotional wellness? which I, I think arguably potentially could relieve that stigma of talking mm -hmm. to a person because everybody right. has to. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a good idea. I know don't, don't throw daggers at me or throw the computer out the window, but I think it's a good idea as long as it's not a fit for duty evaluation and it's just a checkup. Um, you know, the unions and the FOP and they can all work on the logistics of how that would look but I think genuinely it's a good idea. Yeah, we know it's, it's not a great thing when you're voluntold to do something. Uh, but at the same time too, if it's a yearly basically checkup where you're gonna go talk to the clinician and everything, uh, it's really on you. I mean, and the clinicians are fully prepared that somebody might sit in the office for 30 minutes or an hour and not say anything to them. Uh, you're not getting any benefit out of it because you have the opportunity to open up to mm -hmm. a clinician. But uh, don't take it as a voluntold thing where you're being hurt to basically yeah. help yourself. And it, it does take away the stigma of, well, I'm not going to be the only one that goes to see the psychologist. Everybody has to go see them on a regular basis. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it should not be, of course, like I said, a fit for duty evaluation. Right. It should just be a general check in. How are you doing? And, and ultimately it all works itself out as far as the legalities and, and the, and the duty right and if you have a good peer support program going and you're utilizing that throughout the year by the time you get to your uh, yearly check-in with, with the clinician you're good it, you're good because you've been working with peer support the whole year long so you can tell your clinician i've been talking to so-and-so from peer support i had this going on i am feeling a lot better and the clinician will be like outstanding see you next year <laughs> very good so you know the depart say I'm, I'm not going to paint a scenario uh, uh, okay. or reasons. Let's just say for whatever reasons, an officer doesn't want to access officially any of the resources that, that are in their department. Mm -hmm. um, how, what do you advise them to do about, about reaching out for help? There are a lot of options. Of course, we, we readied ourselves as an, as an option to contact us to find resources outside of their own department. Um, cop line, 
the, the hotline that we talked about also has resources around the nation that they offer. Uh, telehealth, if you do a search on psychologytoday.com, you can find a psychologist or a mental health professional that does they, what they specialize in. They list what they specialize in and you can do a search by that. Um, as far as insurance and payments and all that, of course, different clinicians have different salaries and different insurances and things like that. But make sure the most important thing is that one, you're getting the help that you need and two, that you go to somebody who's culturally competent, competent in the first responder world. And you can do that through any of the organizations that we've listed or through psychology today. They have resources who are listed on there as well. Got it. You know, if you, um, what about faith-based resources? Um, does that cross over into the, into the things that, it, that it y'all does. work on? And mm -hmm. how, where, how, how does somebody find that? Particularly, we have a, a question from a, from a department chaplain mm -hmm. about where, what are some faith-based resources that, that they could have to provide for their department? Well, International Critical Incident Stress Foundation offers a wide variety of training for chaplains. Um, there, there is a lot of training out there for chaplains who want to become involved in the chaplaincy program at their departments. In our department, and I believe in Javier's department, the chaplains are part of the peer support team. Right. Very important. Yeah. And, and an essential part of the peer support team. Um, there, there are different beliefs, of course, in, in face and most departments have somebody representative of each faith and they're an important aspect of any peer support team. Yes. It, 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 it sh all pistons shouldn't be firing when it comes to this peer support unit. All hands on deck. Right. You have your officers, you have your, uh, so non, your non sworn that are part of the peer support unit. And then you have your chaplaincy also, because that way it's one stop shopping. As I was saying earlier, peer support's a foundation. And if you have a good peer support unit, that's using all the resources, it's going to be, uh, mm -hmm. a great thing for your department because you're dealing with it, everything on the ground level, whether it's faith-based or you don't want it, if you're not faith-based, but you want to talk to a peer, it's all there for you. And the, the training with ICIS is, is uh, heavily devoted to chaplain's training. So it's, it's really good training as far as chaplaincy goes. So when we talk about peer support, you know, there's a broad spectrum of intervention mm -hmm. that can be labeled as peer support anything from someone who is untrained but they're just your buddy that you right. commiserate with and share things with all the way to a certified peer specialist that's working as part of a clinical team and mm -hmm. everything that they do is a part of the medical record right, right? so this is like a, this is more the mental health field than, than necessarily right. um just law enforcement so i'm sure or i'm not sure i'm asking so within departments the the official peer support you know, that can be a, I'm sure it could be somebody's primary duty. It could be a secondary tertiary volunteer mm -hmm. duty. There might be varying degrees of record keeping mm -hmm. and those kind of things. Right. One of the concerns that somebody brought up in a question is, do you know of any peer support related case subpoenas where they were had to testify in court? And, and like, what kind of records can sometimes a peer support person be keeping and how would you recommend a peer support program within a department handle those situations? Well, there, therein lies the difference between talking to a friend and talking to an official peer support team member. Um, because if you talk to your friend, of course, they can be compelled by the department to, to speak to internal affairs or, you know, the chief or whatever the case may be in that department. Um, officially trained peer support team members in Texas were covered by law. Our, our health and safety code covers the confidentiality as long as you've been trained in crisis intervention. And so that, that has been um, utilized heavily. Now, I, I also have heard of a case where a peer support team member did have to testify in a hearing, but they were, their confidentiality was waived by the officer. So right. it wasn't a subpoenaed information. I don't know of any cases where it has been subpoenaed against an officer in the one case that I know of the officer allowed it to happen. Right. And the thing about uh, peer support, it's not a tactical debrief. Right. You don't go to the officer who's involved in a critical incident and say, Hey, I'm peer support. You can tell me whatever, everything you want. Tell me what happened out there. It's not, that's not what it's for. It's not a tactical debrief. It's basically like Kathy likes to say, 
be there for them. Right. Be there with them when they're standing off to the side at this crime scene and be a source of them to lean on, get yeah. them food, get them water, whatever they make the phone calls that they need. That's what's most important in the initial phases of, right. of, a, of a critical incident. But it's never ever think that you become peer support because you're gonna get the dish on every yeah. officer involved shooting or whatever yeah. critical incident. That's not what peer support is. It's right. emotional support. And it's, it's, it's not to talk about the issues that internal affairs would be concerned about or the chief's office would be concerned about. It's, it's more, to, like Javier said, to be there for them, offer them phone, offer them food, any, any kind of comfort items that they need, and just to listen to them. Right. And record keeping wise, uh, I think what a lot of people are concerned about is like, is my name going to be on some kind of SharePoint? Uh, it should not be that way. Right. It should be officer with the designated number uh, that came in to talk about an issue about family or something like that. And different departments handle it different ways. Some departments have no record keeping whatsoever as far as who that peer support team talks to you. And I, I don't think that there's any one set way of how to do it. Um, one, per, one department could have no record keeping whatsoever. Another department can have the confidential number that's been assigned to them and only one person knows who that was. There's varying ways to handle it, but it, how, however it is, it just needs to be confidential. That's the most important thing. That's awesome. Well, Kathy, Javier, we're reaching, we're reaching the end of our time. I can't thank you enough on behalf of the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute and the Caruth Police Institute for joining us. Any, any last words before I close this out? You go first. Just please, if you, if you need help, get it. Contact us. We're, we're available you know, 24 seven cop lines available 24 seven. Um, just don't think that you're fighting this battle alone because there are a lot of people that are out there fighting it with you. Right. And like, I always like to say, it's all about just one contact. And we have a, a, a challenge campaign that we do. That's really simple. Hashtag just one contact, make that contact with that. You, when you think somebody needs that help, but also don't forget to check in on the strong ones too, because sometimes your strong ones are so busy helping everybody else. They need that peer support so they can get what they're feeling out. It's all about living, loving, and caring. That's what it, it, it's all about. That's awesome, guys. Thank you very much. And for everybody that attended today, I want to thank you guys for coming. Um, this is the first of a series of four. So this will be happening the, the following three Thursdays as well. We're going to have another one of those resources that's available for law enforcement, um, for peer support and clinical services in 22 kill based out of the Dallas Fort oh, yeah. Worth area. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. They do Great. telemedicine as well. They will be our guests next week to talk about what oh, they do, awesome. share more information. Um, so I hope all of you will join us. It will be the same login. So it will be, you know, the same uh, webinar nine number thing is going to be for all four series. So you don't need to get a different link. Just show up next Thursday at six o'clock and we hope to see you all again. Um, from the bottom of my heart, Thank you for all you do, that thin blue line. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for, you know, I was a vet and people thank me for my service. And I'm like, you know, uh, people serve for a lot of different reasons. And I know for law sure. enforcement yeah. does, does. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being out there in harm's way, keeping me and my family safe. And until next week, take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.